Father, we are just incredibly grateful to you for the privilege we have to come and dive into your word and to hear your heart for the nations. We ask God that you would speak to us who are listening now, but we ask for everyone who is going to watch this video, that Lord, you would speak to them. You would open their ears to hear what you are saying. You would open their heart, God. You would birth compassion. You would give a vision for the nations that you alone can give. We ask that missionaries will arise, God, that those you are calling uh, to step out to the field will arise. So we just give you all the praise, Father, and all the glory for your goodness, your kindness, and your mercy. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're watching this video online, we'd like to know where you are watching from. I know those who are in the in the in the room now. We have Ghana, we have Liberia, we have um uh, um uh, JD, which country is that? Rwanda. Rwanda. We have Rwanda. So we have several nations in the room. We are already a nations. People of nations, kingdom-minded people, so excited about that. So we are going to go ahead and start, and we are, we're talking about missions today. And I wanted to just share a few things that I think are so important when it comes to, to missions. Uh, the, first, the first thing that I think is just incredibly significant. A minute, please. Okay, Pastor Vesely, can you mute yourself? I'm trying to mute you. Thank you. Okay, one minute. I might have to pin myself just so that when people join, if not, I still see that happening. I don't know how to pin... Okay. Oh, the man of God is ready. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so good morning again, or good evening. It's evening. Uh, while we are doing, we are recording this class. Uh, and we want to talk about missions. We want to talk about God's heart for missions. I'm going to turn a little my camera. I'm recording from my kitchen, so forgive me. If you see anything that looks like yeah. food, don't get hungry. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so we are talking about missions and we are looking at God's heart for missions. And and uh, and, and I know this is a course that several of you have already done, but it's just been like a lot in my hand. A few reasons um, uh, for these courses because there's been like... In recent years, there have been several people who say missions is no longer needed. It's not just missions, like missions in general is no longer needed, but the need for cross-cultural missions is no more. That we don't need cross-cultural missionaries. We don't need missionaries um, leaving their country to go to another country again because of globalization, because the world has become like a, just a tiny little village and you have people everywhere and every from everywhere, almost in every place. And in some way that makes sense. In some way there is some truth to that, that we have in my town, we are a, a town of like just 12,000 people, but we have about 46 different nations in our town. And yes, the world is, a, part, a portion of the world is gathered around there, but it still doesn't change the fact that there are some places in nations that will never be reached until missionaries leave and go there. There are some places even in nations that are all Christian nations that, will not be rich, will not experience the saving power of, of Christ, will not experience God's move if somebody doesn't get up to go there. And I think it's so important that we come to that realization that we know that and we are willing and intentional uh, as God's people to say, God, what are you calling us to do in this time? What are you saying to us as a people? What are you saying to us as a body of Christ? How, how can we rise up to become this faithful agent that you're calling to do what your mission is for us in this time and in this generation? I keep turning and turning. Okay, hopefully I finally get a, a cool spot that is good enough. So that is... I believe that is God's heart. I believe missions is God's heart. I believe that's what God is calling us to do. I believe that is uh, what God desires for us as his church and as his people. Okay. Hopefully I think this is a better position now. Uh, and so I'm going to, today I think the focus is going to be mostly on 
defining what missions is and seeing what the Great Commission is and seeing what our role is and seeing uh, why we need to go respond to missions. So those are just like, so it's, we are going to like, I would say like this is Missions 101, laying the foundation and seeing what missions is all about. Why is it important? Defining some terms that will help us understand uh, understand all of, of, of what missions is. And one of the scriptures that I think are really significant uh, in missions when we are going to talk missions is Matthew 28. It's the Great Commission, uh, Matthew 28, verse 18 uh, through 20. I'm going to read that, Matthew 28 from verse 18 through verse 20. And I'm reading from the new um, revised standard version. Wait a minute. The Bible says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I am with you always up to the very end of the age. So Jesus is giving um, his disciples this command. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But before he gives them the command of, of going, he says, all authority has been given to me. Uh, there's another version to say that all power has been given to me. So there is authority and there is power. And Acts, Acts 1 also says something. Acts 1 says, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. So Jesus is saying, all authority has been given to me. And now I'm giving you that authority. And, and authority is, when we come to missions, authority is, I think it's a term that we truly need to understand. Because authority has nothing to do with, with my, uh, um, uh, my strength my physical ability, my anointing, and my power, and all of that. Authority is something that is delegated to someone else. Someone in a position of authority, someone in a, in a higher position, in a higher office, delegates um, a, a part of their responsibility to somebody else and says, now I charge you with authority, go and function in this. Let's take the example of a police officer. A police officer comes, stands on the road with their uniform, and then they stop a car. That police officer might be tiny like this, skinny. Uh, but that car will stop. It doesn't matter how gigantic the guy who is in the car it looks like. They stop not because of the officer's physical strength. They stop because of the office that the officer is representing. They know that the officer has been charged with authority to function where they are functioning. So when the officer says, stop, and give me your papers. That person stops because the officer is representing an authority that is higher than them. And so when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, now I give you some. Now I charge you. So when we go out on missions, we are not going in our names. We are not going in our own power. We are not going in our own strength. We are going in the authority of Jesus Christ. We are going, and when, when we know that, then the fear of, oh, what happens to me? Oh, the fear of what if I don't succeed? The fear of what will be the outcome? Like that fear is taken away because we know that we have been delegated to go. When the, um, the ambassador of maybe the United States in Liberia is functioning, they are not functioning in intimidation. They are functioning, they represent the United States. They function like an ambassador. They represent the president of America. They know their authority. They know their rights. They know how they have to operate. And guess what? The Bible says we are ambassadors. We are missionaries. So when God, God, Jesus is telling his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. It's a command. It's a command that is not only to those who are called to go and be full-time missionaries. It's a command to every believer. And I think that's one of the things I just really want to stress. Each child of God is on mission. Each child of God has a mandate of making disciples. Because that's the essence of missions. So this command wasn't to professional missionaries. This command wasn't to professional pastors. This command wasn't to those who are called to full-time ministry. It is for every believer. And I think that is so important that each child of God understand our missionary calling, our missionary role, our missionary assignment. And the text says, uh, go and make disciples of all nations. Actually, the Greek word, um, the, 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 
when 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 like growing up when I used to read this text, I felt I thought that the word go was the imperative of the text, but it's not the imperative of the text. If you read it from the Greek version, it says, as you go, make disciples. So the imperative is not, is not the goal. The imperative is the making of disciples. So as you go to school, make disciples. As you go to your medical profession, make disciples. As you go to your law firm, make disciples. As you go to your business, make disciples. So the imperative is not the goal. It is the making of disciples wherever we go. And we see what happens in the book of Acts when the disciples are persecuted and they scatter all the way running. Whatever they went, they made disciples. That's why we have the gospel today. So as they went, they were making disciples and the church was multiplying. Their impact was increasing because as they went, they made disciples. So the imperative is not the going. It is the making of disciples. So are you making disciples as a child of God at your job? Are you making disciples uh, in the business that you are running? Are you making disciples in your home? Because there are, there, are, there are people that God will not reach, where places where God has placed you, that you are the missionary in that place. And I think that's why for those who say that we don't need cross-cultural missions, most often that is the backdrop from which they are talking about. And, and somehow I agree because every believer is called to be a missionary. But then I also know that there are places, there are, there are just so many places where the gospel hasn't reached yet that somebody would have to leave their comfort zone and step out to and go to, to be able to see those places rich with the gospel. Uh, so let's look at a few um, uh, other texts. Um, uh, Acts chapter one, verse eight. The text says, and you will receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit come upon you. Let me just read directly from the scripture so that I'm not. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the earth ends of the earth. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, the Bible says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, I'm all, I'm all the way to verse six. Verse eight says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I don't want to do all the exegesis of what it means to be a witness. But the Bible says you will receive power and you will be. And it's, it's, like, it's like a continuation of the text. Because you have received power, you will be. Because you have received power, you will be. So Jesus says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the purpose of the power is for you to be a witness. And you know, uh, most often as believers, we think that the purpose of power is for me to show how anointed I am. The purpose of the power is for me to be able to uh, let the world see me or let people see uh, my, 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 my spirituality. No, the purpose of power is to enable us, empower us to be witnesses. So Jesus is telling the disciples, you will receive, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. You will speak in tongues, yes. But the purpose of all of that is for you to be a witness. And who is a witness? A witness is somebody who represents, who talks about, who declares something they have seen, heard, and experienced. And so we can't be witnesses if we have not been experienced the transformation power of God. So Jesus is saying when, you, you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be empowered to live in the way that your life is a witness. You'll be empowered to talk in a way that the message you preach, the words you speak will bring convictions to the hearts of people. When, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be empowered in a way that when you meet the sick and you lay hands on them, they will be healed because that is what is going to testify to who Jesus is. That's what means you have been empowered to be a witness. And so remember the first word we had talked about was authority. So the first thing that Jesus gives is authority. It's like I charge you, I, I command you, it's, I give you part of my, uh, the thing that, the, the rights that I have, the privilege that I have, I hand it over to you, go and function. But now he gives us the power so that when we go in that authority, we can produce results. And so as a missionary, when we go in the authority of Christ, we are supposed to exercise the power of Christ because that is what empowers us to be a witness. When, when if you look at the book of Acts, when the disciples went out, when the sick were healed, they were, when the sick were, people were sick, they were praying for them and they were getting healed. And people were like, oh, wow. These are disciples and they come, people were coming to Jesus when the people were bound and they were depressed and they were in sicknesses. As they were ministering to them, they were being set free. 
yokes were broken, the, the, those who were bound were being liberated because that is the power that enables us to be witnesses. So the power to be witness for a missionary is both the power um, uh, that empowers us to preach with effectiveness in a way that lives change, that lives are changed and transformed, is a power that comes upon us, that gives us the grace to live and walk in the way that honors Jesus, that people can see our lives and like, oh, wow, I like the way you live. I think like you look like Jesus, like they call the early disciples Christians and want to copy us. But then it's also the power that comes upon us to bring solutions to the world, bring answers to the world, bring answers to those who are broken, uh, those who are bound. Like Jesus uh, said in, in the, the, the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news, to deliver, uh, to set the oppressed free, to bring healing to those who are sick. That is part of being a witness. So being a witness is threefold. It's not just to go and evangelize. No, it has to be threefold. Uh, there is this saying that preach the gospel uh, with your words, preach the gospel, um, uh, preach the gospel and if needed, use words. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't use words. It means while I'm using my words, my life should also be speaking the gospel, the actions that take should be speaking the gospel, the miracles that God is doing through me should be speaking the gospel. So being a witness is threefold. It's our lives that are changed and empowered that we are empowered to live right. Uh, it's the anointing that comes upon us that we are able to preach the word of God with power, with simplicity so that people's lives are changed and transformed. But it's also the anointing to bring healing, deliverance, hope upon people. So it is threefold. So that's so when the text is saying, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, you shall be my witness. So that is what missions is. Missions is going out to the world in the authority of Jesus and exercising the power of God to see a world that is dying come to know Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Missions is going out in the authority of Jesus, exercising the power of Jesus to see a world that is bound, to see a world that is in sin, in, in sin to see a world that is in darkness come to experience the saving power of Christ. That is missions. That is missions. And for some people, it's going to be local. For some people, it's going to be cross-cultural. For some people, it's going to be cross-national, national, however it is. It might be from one continent to the next continent. It's going to be different for each one of us based on how God is calling us to calling us to serve him. And so I want to just use or uh, give a few definitions that uh, we have like in our curriculum. The first one is missions means to be under a command to complete a task. Uh, the task that we read is uh, the task of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. So the command that we have is to, the task of reaching the, preaching the gospel to see that the gospel is preached to all the nations, every tribe, every tongue that everybody has heard before the coming of Jesus. The Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. So we are under a task of God to see that this mandate is accomplished. We are under God's command to see that people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation hear this gospel of Christ. The reason why we have received it is not just for ourselves. It's not just for us to get breakthrough. It's so that People from every tribe, every tongue, every nation also get the privilege of hearing that. Another thing about missions is that missions is a combat operation. I like, I like the military part of, of our faith because there are times that it's easy to, to, to celebrate God when everything is going well. Oh, the Lord just blessed me. I just had this thing and I just had this breakthrough. I was praying for this and I got answers. But then when warfare comes, when the attack of the enemy comes, at times we are really not ready. But when somebody is stepping out on missions, we know, you know that you're going on the forefront of battle. You know that you're going into any enemy's terrain to take people out of darkness to bring them into the light of Christ. So it is a combat operation. It's not an operation that we step into carelessly. It's not something that we step into uh, like it's for fun or just a joke that we are, we are doing. No, it's not a joke. It's a combat operation. It's military engagement that we are in. Taking people from the powers of darkness, delivering people from captivity, people who are bound, oppressed with just all kinds of things, taking them, bringing them back to the light of Christ. And the enemy will not just sit down and watch us see, watch and see hundreds of people being saved and villages come to know Jesus and and countries that are close come to know Jesus and you will just see that just like, hey, I'm so happy with what they are doing. I like it. Man, people are getting, no, the enemy will not sit. 
it's going to be a warfare. And that's why it's an oppression that we don't, just the same way in the military, people don't go to fight all by themselves. It's always all of this. You have people who are on the forefront. You have the, the Air Force. At times you have the Marine. You have those who are on land. But even those who are on land, you have those who are in front. You have those who are like a cover-up. And so missions, as, as those who are called to missions or those who are called to serve uh, God in specific uh, missionary uh, calling, so assignments, we need to know that that's the kind of operation that we are called to function in. So when we are, if we are on the front line, we can't be on the front line alone. We have to gather a lot of people who are going to cover us in prayer. We have to gather people who are going to be supporting those. It has to be an entire team because it's not something that anyone does alone. Uh, the second, the third, the third definition of missions that we have in our curriculum is that it's a person or a group of people who live from one community, from one locality, from one space to go to another place to conduct negotiations, uh, to give, to render services, to to build relationships and all of that. And that's and that's part of what missions is. That's just a general definitions from, from di the dictionary. And in Christian missions, it's the same. We live from where we are. We leave our comfort zones to go at times to somebody's home to build relationships, to negotiate, to see that their faith, their children come to know, to know Jesus. And then another definition of faith is of, of missions is fulfilling the great commission, which is a commission of go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I would just like to add to that that uh, uh, the great commission is 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 uh, both like you can't fulfill the great commission if you don't fulfill the great commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind then you can love your neighbor as yourself. So the fulfillment of loving our neighbor as ourself has to be a product of our loving God. Because when we love God and we go out to reach the world from a place of love, that's where transformation truly happens. We can love people where because we have loved God well and we have received love from God, well, then we can go out and love the world better. So I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask if anybody has a question. You can type your, type your, or maybe I'll just continue, but type your question in the chat. Let me see if anybody has a question. And I will answer those questions. I will be looking at the chat. Okay, let's look at the Great Commission itself. I'm all... In Matthew 28, we already read that uh, Jesus told the disciples, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, go forth and make disciples of all nations. And there are a few, a few things that I think I just really want to stress about. It says go and making disciples require a few steps. And I think that's what Matthew 28 tells us. It says, teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And teaching is not only like what I'm doing. There is, this is part of teaching, but in discipleship, teaching at times has to be maybe a lifelong uh, relationship. It has to be doing life with the people. It has to be at times beyond the classroom. At times it has to be having conversation, ha asking questions. And I know we live now in a digital world where discipleship can happen across media. And so uh, there are times when discipleship is going to, the teaching is going to be beyond, beyond just what what I'm doing now beyond the classroom part of teaching is what I'm doing but another part of teaching is a life experience and at times that's why I really love to listen to to read or listen to people's stories because there is so much about the story of a person that tells who they are that tells the values they stand for that tells you why they do what they do you learn a lot from somebody's story at times much more than um, uh, you can even learn from just a conversation with them and so uh, it's so important that we are in, in the process of making disciples, that we are intentional in building those relationships, in, intentional in asking questions that allows people, that allow people to go deep in their work with God, deep in their faith. Because the purpose of disciples, the purpose of missions is to make disciples. And if we are not making disciples, converts are incredible, but converts don't have what it takes to stand 
uh, tough times. They don't have what it takes to stand the challenges of the enemy. They don't have what it takes to stand maybe the attacks of the enemy that might come. When the enemy comes with arrows and there's warfare that rises, most often converts don't have what it takes to stand. To stand and it takes disciples. It takes disciples to stand. The, the, the attacks of the enemy. There, there, there are some people you see like they are believers that love Jesus. They are like, they are all like going. But then by the time one storm come against them, you're like, oh, what happened? Because their faith is so shaken. But disciples are those ones who are able to say, God, even though you slay me, yet I will trust you. Who are dead to serve, who are fully yielded, who are fully surrendered. And that doesn't happen in one day. It, it takes time to do that, to build people to that place. And we see Jesus spent three and a half years with his disciples. And even still, Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. Some of the other disciples ran away. They, went, they couldn't even stand to watch him die. So discipleship, it's a process. It takes time. It takes investment. And so it's important that as missionaries, we don't give up when we don't see the result or the outcome of our investment in one, maybe one month or one year. Uh, we need to know that it takes time. It takes a lot of investment, a lot of prayer. But we can't forget also that it's something that happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. So as missionaries, our work has to be rooted in prayer. It has to be soaked in prayer. It has to be like just hovered over in prayer because we know that there's a Holy Spirit that will bring the results of, the, of what he has called us to do, the people he has called us to reach. He's a Holy Spirit that will change their life. He's a Holy Spirit that will transform them. So Jesus tell them, um, uh, teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. And then he also says, uh, another thing about mission, she says, let me read, sorry, let me read the text again. Therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So the first thing is all nations. Uh, first one is teach. But who are you teaching? It says all nations, all nations. And I'm going to make this comment, maybe mostly is for, for those of us who live in North America or maybe in Europe, uh, especially in Africa, uh, I think one of the things that at times that just really, really gets my heart is I'm so thankful for the early missionaries uh, from Europe, America, who came to Africa. Some of them died in our land. Some of them died serving, serving or serving our, our fathers. Some of them died trying to preach the gospel to us. Did they make mistakes? Yeah, they made mistakes. Some of them didn't even know. They just thought they had heard the good news and they were trying to propagate. They were not, some of them were not the best of missionaries, but their heart was to see people change and transformed. But what, 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 what at times is heartbreaking is that this gospel that they brought to us, I believe the baton for mission has been passed to Africa because the rate at which God is bringing people to Jesus, the rate at which African young people are coming to the kingdom is incredible. But at times my concern is if we are not careful, we might miss the season of God. We might miss the season when it is our time to go forth and bring that, take in the harvest of the world. We might miss out on it because we are afraid, because we have settled in our comfort zone, because we are trying to build towers of Babels and build kingdoms and we are ignoring the nations that God is. Just imagine if that maybe the, the Americans, the Afred Sakers and, and the one who came to Liberia, the early missionaries in Liberia, uh, what if those missionaries said no, they were not going to come? What if they chose not to come? They had the gospel, they received it. What if they didn't respond to come? Some of them had to learn languages. Some of them had to be beaten by mosquitoes. They have to be, like, it was just so much suffering that they had to go through, but they did it because they wanted to bring the gospel to us. And as I said, uh, my concern is that like our missional impetus, and I know I'm not saying that we don't have missionaries in Africa. No, we have great mission, mission movements in Africa. We have mission organizations who are doing incredible work like APRO and, and all of that. New Generation, I think we are doing incredible missions work. Uh, DNM, we are doing some incredible missions work. But I think we, we have not scratched the surface yet with regards to the number, the hundreds of thousands of young people or of people who are coming to the kingdom every day. The resources that God is giving the church of Africa with regards to our missionary response is so tiny with regards to what I believe God is calling us to do. And I think it's so important that as 
as the church, as believers, that we start rising to start saying, God, how can we become missionally responsible? We are on fire for Jesus. We love the Lord. Uh, and I'm going to share a few ways that I think that if we think things that if we start doing, it might start bringing a change and start shaping the culture of the church for the church to start turning its eyes from itself, particularly the church in Africa, to start turning its eyes from itself to the global church, to the global world, to the harvest that is ripe uh, for, for harvesting. And so when Jesus, when, when the, the text says, go and preach the gospel to all nations. Now, let me make it practical. I'm serving, I'm, I'm, I've been called, and now I'm serving here in America. I've served in other nations, African nations, and now I'm called to serve in America. As an African, I'll confess to you, it is easier for me to want to only look for Africans to preach the gospel to them in America. Because they understand my language. I can sing and dance like them. We can shout together. They understand where I'm coming from. But that's not what missions is about. Missions is, is, missions is not about me going to a nation and looking for people who are like me to reach people who are like me. When God sends us to a place, if it's to a nation, if it's to a school, if it's, it's to reach the people who are of that place. Am I saying that if I, reach, if I see Africans in America, I won't reach them? No, I will reach them. Because maybe that's the opportunity that God has given to them. But what of the Americans in this nation? What of the, the Caucasians, the Native Americans? What of the African Americans? What of those who have been here for generations? Who will be the missionary to them? Who will be God's voice to them? Who will be God's instrument to bring revival? And it's the same to Europe. In Europe, most often when you see an, uh, a church that is led by an African leader in Europe, 90% will be Africans. And you might see one or two people from that nationality, and at times it's because they are married. It's a spouse who is, really, who is an African. And I think we are missing out on God's mandate. We are missing out on God's mission. I, I, I think it's time that we become so intentional. It's going to be hard work. Think of the missionaries who left from here to come to us in Africa. It was hard work for them to learn the language. It was hard work for, for them to navigate our culture. And it's going to be hard work for us to navigate this culture or whatever culture, whether it's Australia, whatever. It's going to be hard to navigate those cultures. But we can't take it for granted that God has sent us on a mission. Whatever work we'll have to do to, to become intentionally cross-cultural, to become intentional in making the gospel culturally relevant, in bringing the gospel that is receivable, acceptable, that brings change not only to people who are like us, but bring change to the people that God has sent us to. That, that is, that's when we are going to really be fulfilling the missional mandate of God. Let's not forget the Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. Uh, John says, Behold, I saw people standing before the throne of God from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And they were all worshiping Jesus. It's not going to be only people who look like me. It, shall be, it will be people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation worshiping Jesus together. And another thing that I think is so important when the Bible, when the text say all nations, and as I'm saying, this one is, I'm focusing mostly because I'm, I'm in North America. And so I'm talking because of the experience that I have living in this nation. Oh, it's that there are many people from the 1040 window. The 1040 window is the longitude and latitude. It's the area um, the, around the equator where that is least reached with the gospel. Most, a lot of Muslims, a lot of enemies, it's, those are like the, the least rich areas. But many of those people are coming to America because this is a land of the free. This is a land of opportunity. So they are all coming to, to see life, to experience a better life. And guess what? That has become our mission field. God is saying, what if I'm able to reach an Afghanistan here? Number one, the persecution they would have faced in their country is not going to, they, won't, they might be persecuted, but it's not going to be the same. They won't be killed because they know that if they kill them while they are here, then the American government will certainly arrest them. So we have this incredible, enormous opportunity to preach the gospel to these people that otherwise would not have been able to reach them. And so it's important for us to start thinking as a church, God, how do we break through to these people? How do we bring this gospel that you've given to us? Here they are. We have been praying for them to be saved, but here they are now. They are our neighbors. How can we reach, bring the gospel to them? 
we can't keep looking only for people who are like us. It's for people from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And even for you, who are, who are on the line. And in Liberia, we have many people from China. But how many of them come to our Liberian churches? Because we don't see, we, we don't, we don't think, we, we don't see like God is calling us to reach them. We have people from. It's, it's so funny how the world has become so global. In almost every nation, you have people from almost any nation scattered. But what if we became intentional as God's people to say, God, you brought them to us and we are their missionaries. Would you show us how to reach them? Would you open the doors? Would you touch their hearts? Would you change them? We are available. Just imagine what God will do if we are able to do that. Sorry, oh, my camera turned. I was trying to read the question. I could have read it here. So I'm going to start reading it on my computer instead. <laughs> so how does the missionary know his time in the mission field has expired? Oh, man. I think when you walk with God as a missionary, you would know. Or let me read the, the question. Is, it says, how does a missionary know that his or her time on the mission field that has expired? I think you would know. And that's one of the things with God is in our walk with God, it's seasonal. It's God normally, he tells you this, what I'm calling you to do, but he doesn't give you the picture from January 1st to 2028, 20, 2030. He doesn't give you. He says, Abraham, leave your father's house to a place I will show you. And it's just walking in obedience, one step at a time. When, when it's time for transition, when you walk with God, you will know as a missionary. You will, walk, you will know that it's time there might be circumstances that come around. It might be God speaks to you clearly, but there are just several ways that God will speak to you without you will know that this time is over. God might start putting something else. Like it might be a holy a discomfort in your spirit. You're no longer comfortable with, with where you, you were or where you are. And you just keep knowing that there is more God. There is more. I feel like you're calling me to something. And when you start sensing that at times, it doesn't really mean that it's time. It might be time for you to start praying into it. To start saying, okay, God, what does the next, next, next phase look like? What are you saying? What are you calling me to? Uh, because we want to know clearly uh, what it is that God is saying and what the next phase uh, looks like. But we, we are going to know when you start sensing the discomfort, when you start sensing like I'm done, you start sensing like I've already given all that I have. There are people that you've trained and you've discipled and you're like, you start saying like, oh man, mission is done. Mission is accomplished. You, you know it in your spirit and you start knowing it's time for some, like your spirit is going to know. You might not know the details of what the next looks like, but you will know that transition is coming. And then now you can start praying for what that transition is going to look like and what God will want uh, that transition to look like for you. Um, and so I think it's, and I think that's so important because there are times we stay longer on a field than God would have called us. But then there are also times when, when uh, let me give my example with Liberia. I don't think my mission in Liberia is over. I think, I think uh, my mission in Liberia has changed how it's supposed, like uh, the living in the country, but I don't think it's complete. I think there was a season of transition when God was like, okay, now I think the seeds have been sown, the foundation has been laid. Now I'm calling you out to go to this next phase and prepare you a little more. But it doesn't mean that as I'm taking you to this next phase to prepare you a little more, I'm done with you here. I'm going to send you back again to be able to do it because what I have learned now shapes how I'm going to come back and still be able to do what God has called me to do in Liberia. So I, I think it's important. It's just walking. I don't know how to explain it, but as we walk with God, we are going to know some things your spirit just knows as you walk with God. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice, that of a stranger, and I will not follow. You will know, your heart will know what God is saying. You will, your heart will know the timing and just all the different things that the Holy Spirit is uh, certainly asking and wanting you to do. Uh, another person said, does God really call people to part-time ministry or what is it like? Yes. I, I don't know. I don't want to say yes. Yes and no. Uh, because... I don't know if there's a part-time ministry. God might call people, God might call people uh, as ministers, but in the professional world. God might call people as missionaries, but in the public space. 
So God, there are people that God has called and anointed, but they are not anointed to preach like I'm preaching. They are anointed to be in the media space. They're like that, if they miss that, they will miss God. Their mission field is a media space. And if they miss it, they will miss God. There are others who are called and they are called to politics. There is an anointing upon their lives. When they go into the political sphere, everybody else might be compromised and they are not. Look at Daniel. Daniel was in a nation where like, just doing things right meant your life because of the, the higher up and the authorities. But the only proof that you know Daniel's work, Daniel was called to function in the political sphere was first of all, the way God protected him in that space, the way the results that he got in that space, it didn't mean that there were no persecutions, there were no attacks, but he had results that were tangible. He had results that were really evidence of God's call for him in that space. So I believe that there are believers who are called and they are sent on mission to spaces that are not the regular church space for us who are priests. They are called to go to the media. They are called to go uh, to schools. They are called to go to hospitals. That is their mission. That is their assignment. It's not just a job for them. It is a ministry. It's an assignment. So I, I think it's important that uh, we are able to know and distinct. And if I look at myself and I was like, oh, wow, oh, that's what a person is called. I see they are doing both and they are doing it well and they are succeeding and I'm going to try to do it. That's not my calling. So it's important that each one understands what is my calling? What is, is it that God is calling me specifically to be able to do? But then also there are times um, uh, that even those who are called into full-time ministry, that God would... Um, uh, anoint us maybe to be entrepreneurial in while we do ministry god can anoint us to start a business that is thriving and functioning but at the same time we are effective pastors effective missionaries discipling hundreds and thousands of people so it just it, it, those all those are all the things that in that in our own relationship with god that we get to know that we get to figure out we get to decipher and, and at times like the spirit of God, there are some people that God calls and for some people, for maybe the first 10 years of your life, God is like saying, I want you to be 100% focused. It's going to be just ministry because if you try something different, it's going to distract you and take you out. And when you are rooted, God is like, okay, say so now, okay, I'm going to put a million dollars in your hands. I want you to start an investment because God has trusted you enough already. He knows no matter what happens, you will not be. So each one of us, our work with God is different. Our calling is different. The way he's going to deal with us is going to be different. And it's important that we are able to discern and decipher and just understand the dealings of God our regards to how he is calling us to function. So I don't know if I answered that question. Yeah, yeah. Thank Based you. Thank you. Too, can we say everyone is a missionary? Yes, everyone. Everyone is a Thank missionary. You. Everyone. I believe everyone Thank is called to missionary. Everyone is not called to professional missions, but everyone is a missionary. Every believer is, is a missionary. We are all called to do the work of making disciples and, and reaching the world. And so the next thing that in that text in Matthew 28 is to baptize uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to observe all that I commanded you and, and all of that. And so... Um, most often people take missions as uh, going out to a place and just do kind work, start hospitals and build a nice school and take care of the poor. That is part of what missionaries do, but that's not missions. I think any missions assignment that doesn't culminate to the preaching of the gospel and leading people to Jesus is not complete. It's just a non-profit. It's just doing uh, good works because non-profits do that. They don't need, you don't need Jesus to be kind. You don't need Jesus to build schools. You don't need Jesus to build wells. But as much as missionaries should build schools, I think we should build um, uh, houses for people. I think we should feed the hungry. I think we should take care of the orphans and all of that. If we do all of that and forget the gospel, then we have missed it. So every missionary assignment should communicate to leading people to Jesus, to making disciples of Christ. The other things are just extra and bonuses that we do because we love Jesus. But the gospel is central because it's only the gospel that brings transformation. 
it's the gospel that gives power for people to be transformed, power for people to be saved. Okay, I see one more question. I don't know if it's one or if it's two. One minute, let me look at those. Uh, one, is it possible that God sends you to a specific people group in like Paul to the Jews? Yes, God can send you to a specific people group. Yes. There are people who are called to professionals. Like their calling is to people of influence. Like that's their calling. They are called to professionals. And, and they know how to communicate to them. They know, they know how to influence them. They know, they, they're anointed for it. They're anointed for it. There are people who are called to youth. They're anointed for youth ministry. If they try to do something different, it's not going. There are people who are called, who are called maybe to a particular nation or to a particular tribe. Uh, but then also there are times when some of these things are seasonal because there are some people who have locked themselves up in a box and when God was transitioning them to the next phase, they didn't transition. There are some people who start ministry and they are, maybe their initial call was in a particular tribe and they were just faithful with that tribe. The Bible says, well, when you are faithful, we'll lead to guess what, what God will do. He's going to give you more. And when God was adding, saying, hey, I'm going to add another tribe, the people were like, no, God, this is my tribe. God, no, this is a tribe you called me to. And they started arguing with God and they stayed in that space when God was telling them it was time to transition. So God might start with us somewhere. It doesn't really mean that God ends there. It's always, God's intention always is to go to the extremes of the earth. But we have to be faithful with where we are first, faithful with the assignment that God has given us and make sure that we do it well and do it effectively. Any questions before we pause? Lesson 101. Any more questions? Okay, uh, for those who are watching, please type your questions in the chat. Let's hear what you're saying. What questions do you have about missions? And uh, we are going to be able to try to come and answer some of those, maybe in the chat or maybe do a video for a response to your questions. Hope this has blessed you. And I pray that the grace, the grace it takes to fulfill God's mission, God's mandate for your life will be released upon you. And if you're, if you're, if you're an African, call to a believer, call to America. If you're an African believer, uh, serving in Europe, uh, anywhere in the diaspora, May you remember that uh, the reason why you are where you are is because God has a mission. God has a mandate. And may God give you the grace to serve the people that he has, called, uh, he has brought around you. Remember that you are a missionary at your workplace. All those nurses will not have a way to hear the gospel if, not, if it's not you. So preach the gospel. Be a good ambassador. Be a good witness so that people can come to know Jesus Christ and, be, and that Jesus will be glorified. Amen. God bless you all.